Wow. So we have a quorum. Okay, let me get my uh, agenda here. Thank you everybody for coming out today to this Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council General Board meeting. I'm uh, the president, Sarah Clendon, and I'm gonna um, open up this meeting right now. Okay, so uh, this is a, a general board meeting of the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council. The date is Thursday, August 4th. It's approximately 6.07 p.m. Secretary Sanchez, roll call, please. Sarah was muted. Uh, we have Sarah Clendenny. Present. Ben Wadsworth. Present. Vincent Chantem Montalvo. Present. Fernanda Sanchez, present. Nancy Soto is excused. Benny Madra. Present. Emily Har. Emily Har. Present. Oh. Present. Mel Melanie Bolomo Shiflet. Here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Lydia Delizer. I'm here. Jessica Johnson. Here. Diego Zapata. Here. Jill Arevalo. Here. Richard Ortiz. Selena Ortega. Present. And Esmeralda Landeros. Present. That's 14, we have quorum. Excellent, thank you, Secretary Sanchez. Um, all right, so we're gonna open it up to item number two, public comment on non-agenda items. If there's anybody from the public who would like to comment on something that's not on the agenda, you have two minutes to speak, please press star nine or raise your little hand on Zoom. And uh, yeah. Please uh, tell us what's on your mind. I do not see any hands up. What? All right. With that, give you a second chance. Anybody want to raise your hand? Any general public comment? No? All right. So we're going to move on to item number three, community and board announcements, two minutes per person. Um, are there any board member announcements? Start with that for the for the community. We have Gil Arevalo. Gil? Yes, I just want to remind everybody that I do have a class this night every Thursday for a while. Uh, I may it's when the instructor wants to begin the class. It could be anywhere between seven thirty and eight o'clock. I, I hope that we get more people in so that when I leave, you don't lo you lose quorum. Maybe somebody ought to Thank make you, some Paul. phone calls. <laughs> All right. Well, I, you know, the protocol is you're supposed to give the secretary uh, advance notice for an excused absence because we're right well, on. No, I, I, I made this apparent well, uh, several weeks ago. I told them, everybody, that I had a class on Thursday and it okay, and, uh, hopefully that it, it would. Uh, would not interfere, yeah, but the class does. Whenever the instructor gets there, they, uh, they start the class. So, okay. uh, yeah, we have like just enough board members to like make. Yeah, I am. Okay, thank you, Governor. We're gonna keep rolling here, uh, just to keep it going here. Uh, any other? Yeah, Steve. Uh, is this concerning or updates like on removal of the house list? Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, Molten and uh, North Main, uh, the house lists that were living there for a few weeks were removed last week. Just an update. Okay. Thank you. We have Diego. Uh, I'll make it quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Northeast Trees having an event at Aspen Hills Park this Saturday, 9.30 to 12.30. We're going to be teaching folks how to clean seed at our nursery, uh, process seed, collect seed, grow seed. And a plant seed. Uh, uh, it's gonna be great. Um, take some plants home. Take some seed balls to like gorilla garden, flat top. Learn about seed collection, all that stuff. It's really fun. So I encourage anyone who wants to show up to come by Ask Hills Park. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Diego. And that's it. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, any uh, public? Members from the public have any uh, announcements? 
We have two minutes to speak. Please raise your hand or press star nine. Just announcements, General. Oh, Ben. Yeah, I was having trouble uh, raising my hand. I'm sorry about that. But um, I had a couple questions. Like, I, one is I, I'm wondering if I can get re, um, reminded of the. I thought I heard a one of our city reps talk about like a small business loan opportunity. If anybody has has information on that, I would appreciate it to pass it on. And then the other thing I guess was related just on what Diego uh, spoke on or related to uh, to Diego in terms of like, I know the monarch butterfly has gone on the what in the, on the endangered species list and now they're encouraging us to plant a certain type of um, plant that they like. So if anyone has info on that, that would be appreciated. Thanks. All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Benny, uh, the small business loans through the city, that's from uh, EWDD or whatever, they have different phases, but uh, yeah, I, we usually announce it. Um, and I'll let you know. Uh, I have an announcement. Uh, so the city of LA has this, uh, I was looking into this alfresco program. It's for like curbside dining, dining in the streets to alleviate the COVID business loss. City's trying to like kind of make it the norm. There's uh, rules about the public right of way and obstructing it and then umbrellas and all that. Um, but the interesting thing is that this is applicable to street vendors. And so we need to kind of spread the word. I mean, there's some pre uh, requirements like a certain amount of insurance or something, but um, street vendors uh, are just as, uh, able to apply for this as like a, a restaurant or whatever. Um, yeah, so, and we also need to spread the word to our local restaurants. Uh, just so, um, yeah, it just seems like the word's not getting around. Um, cool. And that's through the, uh, it's not the board, Bureau of Street Services. What is it, Vince? It's the um, city, city, Whatever. Bureau of Engineers or something. That's who manages this uh, alfresco dining program. All right, any other um, announcements from the public? I do not see any hands up. All right, board members? No, okay. So we're gonna move on to item number four, government reports, two minutes per person. If there are any government officials, city employees, elected public officials on the line, um, please raise your hand or press star nine to speak and address the community. We have Jose Galvez. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Jose Galvez with the Department of Community Department, the Neighborhood Department Advocate for uh, Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council. Just have some updates for the board. Uh, with the digital communications policy, the departments will be holding a couple of sessions uh, in regards to the policy. Uh, the sessions will start on with the basic of what every NC member should know uh, in using digital channels like social media. Then move into a discussion of, rec of recommendations and tips for NC administrators managing their NC's uh, social media accounts, websites, or newsletters. Uh, you'll have the chance to ask questions about the policy and how it applies to you and your uh, NC accounts um, and your work during uh, event registrations, as well as during the, the live sessions. Uh, so the sessions that we have upcoming are will be for August 31st uh, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And we, uh, there might also be one for the Congress of Neighborhoods as well uh, before the policy goes into effect October 4th, 2022. Um, also in regards to the uh, Zoom payments updates, uh, the department will be paying for the one base license for per NC. And, and again, thank, thank you for, for your patience as, as the department has continued to investigate the appropriate financial processes uh, for neighbor council boards to acquire additional Zoom licenses and reimburse the, the department for the original prepaid annual license. Unfortunately, as the fiscal year grew to a close in, in June, 2022, um, 
we were unable to nail down the process in, uh, with the NC funding program in the controller's office and continue to investigate this topic. As such, because of, of many of the NCs uh, have voted to reimburse the, the department prior to the close of the fiscal year, the department will absorb the cost of the renewal for one license per NC from April 2022 to uh, through April uh, 2023. Uh, to answer some of these questions, uh, just feel free to reach out uh, to me, or you can reach out to, to the department as well um, uh, in regards to the reimbursements uh, expenses. Um, however, if you do wish to purchase additional licenses uh, for the new fiscal year, uh, each license is estimated uh, at approximately $200. Uh, just uh, feel free to uh, let me know, uh, reach out to me. Uh, and we'll work with you to purchase uh, the licenses and the branch reimbursement. So once the process has been confirmed. Um, also, uh, just as a reminder for the Los Angeles Congress of Neighborhoods, uh, the date will be for Saturday, September 24th. Uh, the, the theme of this year's event is the future of LA, celebrating our city. Uh, if you'd like to get more information in regards to the um, uh, Los Angeles Congress of Neighborhoods, you can visit neighborhoodcongress.la and in there I'll provide information regarding the, uh, the, the day of the event, along with uh, several workshops that are usually uh, scheduled that board members can uh, sign up and attend. Also, the public is welcome to, to attend those events. It's going to be all virtual, uh, so uh, it, uh, everyone can access through either mobile devices or laptops that, that you can join through Zoom. Um, and as a reminder for board member trainings, again, just uh, be aware of your, your board member expiration dates. Uh, the department has the expiration dates information for all board members on the empowerly.org backslash LHNC uh, page, uh, where you can see the board roster along with the board uh, members trainings expiration dates uh, that show up uh, 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 on there. And uh, just to note, if you have any issues with the Cornerstone uh, training portal, uh, you can reach out to communications at empowerlake.org. They'll be able to assist you with the login information if you need to reset or something comes up with the portal that uh, either freezes or, or unable for you to move forward, they can look into that and assist. Uh, any questions from the board? I don't see any hands up. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any other uh, government officials, city employees, elected public officials? Next, we have Los Angeles Fire Department, Bat Chief Brett Willis. Brett Willis? Is that him? Right. Yeah, hi there. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Yeah. I can make it awesome. Yeah. Brett Willis, I'm Battalion Chief, LA City Fire Department, Battalion 2, which is on York Boulevard right here in Eagle Walk. Um, I wanted to take a minute, and as part of our community outreach, um, we have some documents, and I, I also would like to get a, a hold of a good email so I can email you guys some documents for a uh, Ready, Set, Go program, some evacuation stuff for um, um, earthquake preparedness and pool safety, drowning safety. Um, but I wanted to take a minute and just, uh, and, and it, these documents are intended to be distributed to the public. So we wanna make sure it gets out, but I um, wanna just review the six Ps, a quick evacuation checklist uh, as we get into um, our most significant wildfire uh, and danger season, try to get the public prepared. So um, people and pets, we wanna make sure we evacuate with our people and pets, pagers, phone numbers, uh, important documents. Uh, the third P is prescriptions, vitamins, eyeglasses, things that are essential to your, uh, your health. Um, Pictures, irreplaceable memorabilia, things that you can comfortably carry and get in a vehicle and go. Uh, and then personal computer, obviously we, our lives revolve around a computer. We wanna make sure that we can bring that stuff so that we're not uh, handicapped by it. Um, and then P, plastic, credit cards, debit cards, cash. Uh, that's the quick list, but our Ready, Set, bro, uh, Go program, um, getting ready means uh, maintaining adequate defensible space. Uh, 200 feet of defensible space is what's required in the city of Los Angeles, but we wanna maintain weeds and grass at maximum heights of the three inches. Remove all your dead trees and shrubs. 
um, and then harden your home. And, and what that means is um, use fire resistant building materials, remove vegetation, debris from your roof, vents, windows, gutters around your home, uh, ensure all combustible materials are located at least 30 feet away from your home. And that's to protect from um, uh, embers and flying uh, uh, debris that's either uh, firebrands, glowing, glowing firebrands. <clears throat> excuse me, and then get set. We want to prepare yourself and your home for the possibility of evacuation before the need arrives. So four quick points on that is have an action plan that includes uh, evacuation, planning for your home, your family, and pets, so that when that time comes, it's you're not trying to build a plan on the fly. Um, and you do have to leave your home. You need an emergency supply kit. Um, have a plan to start preparing for that so that um, you can grab it and go along with um, all the other items you're going to evacuate with. Uh, and the, in the case that you have other people in your family, make sure you've got a communication plan so if you do get separated, contact each other. And then stay informed. Local media and LAFD alerts are available. Uh, www.lafd.org forward slash alerts, as well as at LAFD on Twitter. Uh, we can receive notifications from the city of LA on Notify LA. Uh, that's another good reference. And then finally, with the go, before evacuation is necessary, um, we have that wildfire action plan and shirts there, pre-evacuation preparation steps to increase your home's defense if you have time to do it, uh, and then monitor the wildfires in your area. And so as we kind of get, you know, our season's just starting to get going right now, so we want to make sure the public's ready. Um, but go early. It's not necessarily to wait for authorities to issue an evacuation order. If you feel threatened, evacuate early. Uh, it's always the best op option. It's the safest option. Um, and remember, we need, we need to get firefighters in so that means we need people out. So we can't occupy the road at the same time. Um, so if we do have that uh, situation, we'd like to think about evacuating before it's necessary. Uh, a lot of people think by staying behind, you have a better chance of saving your home. Uh, however, you know, wildfire history and especially local wildfire history makes it really clear that the stay and defend concept sounds reasonable on paper. Uh, in reality, it's actually really dangerous for, uh, for not only the occupant, but also firefighters because we now are in a position to stay with the occupant um, even if we wanted to get out and that does happen. Um, so people decide to stay, uh, before the fire front arrives and when the full force of the wildfire is on them, um, you change their minds and then decide to leave, in which case it ends up, um, you know, clogging up streets and, and it's too late. So we just wanted to have some, some preparation on that as we kind of get into the file, uh, well, a wildfire season. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I also, if I have an opportunity, I'd like to email these documents to you, to somebody. Yeah, uh, Brett, uh, yeah, email them to me, uh, Sarah, S A R A dot L H N C at protonmail.com. And uh, I just want to say, uh, Brett, I was talking to Ernie from uh, Fire Department One. He was saying that they're understaffed. They're like covering for El Sereno and Las Al Park. He's saying that mm -hmm. there's a lack of um, applicants, a lack of. Uh, people wanting to do the job or people qualified. If somebody wants to join the LAFD, what do they do? Or is there an email or something? Join LAFD.org. That's our recruitment website. It's got all of the current steps um, towards the, uh, the um, um, hiring process, all the requirements, steps that are needed. We're hearing that they're going to open hiring again, I believe January or February. Um, I, I'm not you know, I'm not in the recruitment section, but I can tell you we still have a line out the door for the job, which is awesome. Uh, we like good quality applicants. We need to fill the spots. There is a process and it does take time. There's, you know, um, written exam interviews, background investigations, you know, medical and, and psychological exams. And, and so it, it does take time. Um, it's not a very quick process, but uh, so people do need to be patient. Um, we are we are short staffed right now. We do have uh, a lot of people off on long-term injury. We have uh, vacancies from you know, a, a routine um, um, retirements. And so that you know, the, the number of folks leaving in the next couple of years is actually pretty substantial. And they're at the 30 to 35 years of service. So they're, they're ready to retire. So we are looking for good quality people that are interested in coming to work, working hard and protecting the community. All right. Thank you. Uh, you are welcome. Battalion Chief Brett Willis, <laughs> Battalion. Um, cool. All right. Thank you, uh, any other, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, elected officials, city employees, government reps? Yes, we have Huerta from Hollenbach. Hi. 
you guys hear me? Yeah, hey. Hey, guys. This is Officer Huerta. I work at Hollenbeck. I'm the senior lead officer for uh, Lincoln Heights and uh, Monterey Hills, as well as Herman. Um, so there, if you guys have any questions, I know that it's been, it's been pretty busy up in Lincoln Heights uh, the last couple of months, especially because summer has started. Um, we are also uh, kind of low on manpower, so it has been taking a long time to respond to calls and to, to address the needs of the community as they should be addressed. Uh, we are trying. We are uh, deploying more units. We do have overtime details that are filling in for the officers that can't be at work or that are not at work. So uh, we are working hard to to make sure that the service gets the, the uh, response that it deserves. Um, we are working hard. It is it has been really, really busy, especially the Broadway corridor. Uh, I know we've been uh, very, very busy, with not only with traffic accidents, but we've had several shootings and uh, several robberies and um, carjackings in the area. So uh, with that, is there any questions for me regarding any crime or any updates that you guys would like? Um, okay, I have a question. Uh, yes, uh, Selena, are you on the horn? Are you here? So uh, I think we reached out, guys. Yeah, so uh, there was the officer involved shooting on uh, July 27th on Broadway uh, with the um, uh, Maldonado. They just released the name. Uh, in broad daylight and he had a BB gun, right? Uh, so um, we weren't ever really briefed on this. Uh, it is a community member, it turns out. The uh, blood is still on the sidewalk. Um, the uh, video has not been released on the uh, use of force thing on the website. So when will the video be released? Is it 45 days? Correct. It's 45 days, so the video should be released September 10th. It should be on YouTube, and uh, it, the, the release of it would be September 10th. Okay, September 10th. Mm -hmm. um, let me think. Does anybody have any questions for Officer Huerta? Ben? Yeah. Um, yes, Officer Huerta, can you remind us uh, of the policy in regards to like body cameras for the police officers? Sure. So the, the policy goes as whenever there's a public contact, our cameras are, are to be activated. Again, if it's a, a quick question or the, the person looking for directions, um, not necessarily you have to go on camera. But if there's a contact where we stop somebody for a traffic violation or or, or a radio call because there's a, a guy that's vandalizing something or, or stealing something or there's a, a neighbor dispute, then the cameras are uh, automatically turned on. Uh, so that, that's pretty much for every contact we make, we should have our cameras on. And again, it, it depends on, like I said, if somebody's asking for directions or they're lost, uh, not necessarily, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't require us to, to turn on our camera. But now if they have questions regarding a legal thing or, or they need a, a restraining order information, then obviously we'll turn on our camera because they're asking, you know, more in-depth questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Officer Huerta? I don't see any other hands up. Oh, I have a question. So if somebody um, draws a weapon, right? Or just their hand or some stick or whatever, does the finger have to be on the trigger or is it just if the officer feels um, threat, uh, whatever, uh, threatened, right? Um, yeah. If they draw the weapon and point it, do they have to have their finger on the trigger? Because there were three shots fired or four we have on video. Uh, and I have to say that was an excessive use of force. And we have- Yeah, well, it's all up to the, you know, it's the interpretation of who is actually behind the uh, behind that, that incident. Um, I can't speak for the officers, uh, but for myself, somebody points a gun at me. I mean, I'm not going to wait, wait very long to, to hear a bang. I mean, you know, our, our job is to protect the community and our job is to protect ourselves and ensure that we go home at night. Do we know that there's fake guns out there? Sure. Do we know that this individual has a fake gun? We don't. Um, I know that they put out a, a quick brief on uh, one of the websites, so LAP websites, and I, I believe there's a picture of the firearm. If that firearm's pointed at somebody, that's trying to get robbed or they're trying to rob somebody. It looks real. I mean, you know, it all depends on the person, on the individual. I mean, there's been shootings where there was two shots fired, uh, where there was 15 shots fired, there's 20 shots fired. So, I mean, it's all up to the individual that is sitting behind that, that weapon and that, that weapon is pointed at you. So, you know, again, 
it, it, you can't see very far to where the finger is on the trigger. You don't have time to analyze all that. All you see is a gun pointed at you and you do not want to die. I mean, that's something that we have to go home to our families, just like everybody you know, on, on this board wants to go home to their family, not get accosted, not get assaulted, not get robbed, not get killed. And, and our, we are the same. We're people too. You know, we have the same fears that everybody else has. You know, the only advantage we have is we have a gun to protect ourselves. And, you know, again, I'm not speaking for the officers, speaking for myself. If somebody was to point a gun at me, yeah, I, I'm going to defend myself with by any means. I am not going to, I'm going home to my family. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Any other? Um, we have Esmeralda. So we have a um, document on our website related to this and the, the weapon and the uh, SIG Sauer contract with the city and the uh, SWAT. So they're very familiar with this this uh, weapon. Esmeralda? Do we know what escalated, like why the cops were called to the scene and you have body vests? According to the uh, to the, the printout that I saw, it was a individual from the community were uh, telling the, a traffic officer that was there that there was a gentleman with a gun pointing it at people. So uh, I believe the traffic officer observed the male. He put out a, a backup as the male was walking, uh, was walking away from him. And that's when the officers responded. They told him to put the gun down and he pointed at the officers. Yeah. Um, All right. I have one more question. So sure. um, BB guns are illegal. Uh, you know, that one was made by the actual company that makes the actual weapons, SIG, or Smith & Wesson mm -hmm. make a line of airsoft weapons, right? Um, and you can buy the big five and you can buy the BBs and the pellets and they have like an orange tip. So like, what is your advice for uh, like a youngster who buys a BB gun at Big Five and goes into his yard to shoot cans or something, right? That's illegal. Right. Uh, how can people with BB guns protect themselves and make their guns, make it known that they're uh, not real guns? Well, just like you said, if you're in your backyard shooting cans uh, and a neighbor calls, it's our due diligence to call back that person and say hey, is it a bb gun or you know a lot of times people will say and i've heard calls come out there's kids playing with the bb gun and they'll say specifically say it's a bb gun and you know nothing happens we go we knock on the door oh yeah my kids are playing with the bb gun and another responsible thing to do is not walk around on a public street with a bb gun that looks real and pointed at anybody not only officers but at anyone at any person you know you just that's not a, a normal behavior for a normal person or a responsible BB gun owner or a gun owner for that matter. I mean, even if you own a gun and you're responsible, you're not going to walk around with it. You know, I carry a gun all the time and I don't walk around with it exposed. I don't show people I have my gun. I don't point it at anybody. You know, I don't go out and say, hey, I, get, I can carry a gun. It's just being responsible. And if anybody has children and you guys buy them BB guns, you, you know, you have to tell them, hey, this is a BB gun. You, you play with it at home or, or on, in a big field or when you go camping or you go out to the desert. You know, you, you treat it as a real gun and you become a responsible person with that particular toy. You know, it is a toy and it's, but it is dangerous. And, you know, you, they have to go through, you know, there, there's instructions on those BB guns. You know, I've had a BB gun when I was a child, when I was a, a teenager growing up and they tell you a whole slew of things. Don't point it at people, keep away from your eyes, you know, wear, wear glasses, you know, be responsible. So there's a lot of things that, that people can, can talk about and, and be schooled on and say, hey, you don't walk around with a BB gun that looks real in a public street and point it at anybody, at anyone. You just don't do that. You don't carry it in a car. You don't you know, pretend that it's real. You just leave it at home and play with it in a controlled environment. Is it possible that you guys could do a BB gun safety uh, thing? Sure. I can have our, our CAD unit type up a, a BB gun protocol, and then uh, I can definitely email that to you guys. Uh, maybe in a couple of weeks, I can have it done. I'm, I can probably do it myself. Uh, what I could do is I can, you know, contact some manufacturers and give, you know, what their take is on their rules, and then I'll put our gun safety rules. And, and again, I mean, I, I believe that those gun safety rules, the BB gun or real gun, should be the same. You know, every gun is always loaded. You don't point a gun at anything you're not going to shoot at. You know, you don't point it at any person. I mean, you don't do that. So I can definitely type something up and email it out to you guys that way. 
you know, you guys can put it up on your forum and then we, we can have some flyers made and, and pass them out, you know, during any of our events. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. I any yeah. other any other comments? We have no one. Yeah. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Sorry, guys. Um, is there any after an incident like this? Um, I know we're talking about like what the community can do to keep ourselves um, safe, but is there a conversation that goes on um, within like the officer unit to help them, you know, help prevent them from shooting someone with a toy, especially someone, you know, who's having some uh, mental disability? problems uh, we do have extensive training and we do get trained on that um, unfortunately we don't get or unfortunately we don't control what people do we don't control their actions we don't control what they're going to do and how they're going to act um, and what they're going to do with either a fake gun or a gun. and going back to that um, this gun it looked real i mean it, it, i'm looking at it on the photo right now it looks 100 percent real so again we don't control what people do we just react to what they do um, and a lot of that is is what occurs in day-to-day -day police work. I mean, we don't go out looking to fight with somebody. We don't go out looking for trouble. You know, we it, we go out to help the community. Unfortunately, you know, police work is dangerous and it's, it's hard and it's not pretty. A lot of times we get into use of forces and it's not because we are engaging in that because we want to be engaged in that. We're engaging it because somebody's actions require us to take steps to to make to get them into custody and for them to stop committing a crime or hurting somebody else. So you know, unfortunately it's just it's just the way the world is and 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 how it again we react, we're reactive. We're not, you know, we don't go out right. there and say, hey, I'm gonna go fight with somebody today. You know, it's not in our plan today. Yes, I, I want to just make note of record that I am extremely uncomfortable with the, this um dialogue that uh the responsibility to not be killed is on um the community. Um, I, I don't I don't really like how any of this is going um, and there seems to be no responsibility being said, at least in this um, meeting on the part of our officers who are supposed to protect us. This whole thing is making me pretty uncomfortable. I just wanted to um, verbalize that. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Melanie. All right. Um, for the sake of time, I do encourage that we move forward to the next item on the agenda. Okay, so uh, are there, just last call, are there any other city officials? Thank, thank you, Officer Huerta. Um, elected representatives that will speak, <laughs> raise your hand. There are no hands raised. No hands raised. All right, so back to the agenda. Here we go. Let me see if I need to reorder anything. Here we go. Uh, real quick, committee reports. Any committees? Do you have any updates? If you don't have an update, just lay low. The committee? Planning and Lenny's committee, uh, we had a meeting, it was really good. It was uh, a week ago and we're going to have the next meeting in the third week of August. So uh, yeah, just email us if you wanna join. Is this for the representatives too, for like ARC? Yeah. Okay, so just two points at ARC that, were, that weren't as good as we wanted to hear. We had DWP report on the water situation in uh, Los Angeles. And yeah, we don't have no water according to what they're telling us. And there's gonna be a lot of uh, cutbacks on water usage. And we noticed that a lot of the cutbacks were gonna hit the east side and mostly poor people are gonna be uh, um, sided if they use over their waters. So those things still haven't been put into place yet, but they, they said that they were going to be voting on um, uh ordinances possibly regulation that if you went over a certain amount of water you'd have to pay something and they get just give an example like two thousand dollars but they didn't say if it was a year or for each violation they did say that some of the corporations too had to follow um they also mentioned well they didn't want to talk about it but they're running around it which was toilet to tap so there's the big controversy in the LA River on what we're going to be doing with the water with the LA River. And now, you know, maybe about 15 years ago, we had toilet to tap, we fought it. And now it's resurfacing again now because we have no water. So 
there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with water and I hope people have time to attend the meetings and we might even bring some of the presentations to the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council. So water is going to be important. Please keep an eye on it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vince. Any other announcements or com uh, committee announcements? Uh, Fernanda, could you announce when the uh, Lincoln Heights Tenants Union meets every biweekly or whatever and where? Sure, um, at the Church of Epiphany at the first and last Wednesday of every month. That's where the Lincoln Heights Tenants Union meets. Um, first and last, first and last? Yeah, that's right. Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. Yeah, it's really hopping over there. Uh, we have two hands up. We have Emily. Uh, yeah, I just was, I just think it's, a, um, you know, wanted to touch on the water issue. Um, and uh, I, I have not been able to go to one of the meetings. Do they talk anything about, um, about why we are developing so much if we have, or if we're running out of resources? Prince? I don't know. Anyway. Oh. We did ask that question, and basically DWP sets out this water uh, amount to the city, and then it's up to the city to do this development right around those, and they're all based on SCAG numbers, which we all know the SCAG numbers are, they're not accurate. And so that's why we've run into this problem for such a long time. At the end of the day, it's the elected officials that continue to do this risking the health, safety, and welfare of the people when we don't have water. This is kind of sketchy because like we have the, you know, one of the lowest home ownership rates, but water meters and wa water is usually paid for by the uh, landlord at a, a multifamily property or apartment building. And you're not billed for the water, you're billed for the electricity and trash. So is there a chance that like uh, water, Whatever, you know, when you have an apartment, you're usually in the same tier. You're not like going crazy on the water. Um, but if rates do go up for landlords, how would that affect uh, tenants? The, the landlords still can't increase the rent more than 3%, but they can tack on other fees sometimes, right? Correct, that's what's being discussed right now. And I think it's gonna be a bigger discussion and um, it was even asking how will you how will you determine the use and who used the most water if most buildings that, that have units only have one meter. So th these were a lot of things that we brought up because we were focused on the uh, RSO and how it would affect the rent stabilization ordinance in the city and just the average renter whether they could. So I know we're gonna have it on ARC, but I think we have to bring it to our council and the sustainability committee to have more a more thorough and depth discussion and a presentation on it. Okay, cool. And when would that? When are your meetings? It's a, it's going to be what day? The first Wednesdays of every month. Okay, cool. Sustainability committee, first Wednesday of the month. Okay. Any other uh, committee announcements? I do not see any hands up. All right. So, thank you, thank you, Bernie. Uh, we're going to move on to. See, we're pressed for time here. We're gonna do the budget right now. Six, funding items, discussion and possible action on approval of the 2022 to 2023 LHNC budget packet. So that's a supporting document. Um, Vince put together our little budget. We have rollover, right Vince, of 10K. Um, could we pull up that file? Because we're gonna have to take action on um, approving that. Oh, I have one without all the info, but cool. Excuse me about that. Okay, this is our 2022-2023 our uh, budget. It's a packet that we have to fill out every year to get our funds and plus our rollover funds. Uh, so, and this and this is up for anybody to see. We have it pre-signed in case it gets approved or we got to change something. Uh, let me come back here. So what you see is just a, a plain example of how these budgets get put together. 
Sometimes they're similar and sometimes they're not. Because this is an, an election year, some money has to be put into the election fund. So our annual budget is $32,000, which is our regular uh, after July 1st, our budget changes. We're on a, that's our fiscal year. And then last year we had $10,000 that would roll over into our account, making our total budget this year for 42,000. In our office and operations expenditure category, we have here for printing and uh, a $1,500, minute taker, 3,000, translator 2000 for a total of 6500 in the in the office operational expenditure um, our outreach expenditure category has also printing promotional items supplies and events and that totals out to 16000 the election expenditure this year printing and event is 1000 for printing and 1,000 for events for a total of $2,000. Our neighborhood purpose grant um, uh, uh, expenditure is 12,500 this year. And our community improvement project is 5,000. That brings it all up to a grand total of $42,000 for the year. Now just keep in mind on this particular, these particular numbers that we have before us, we can alter them and shift around as needed into the future. If we find out we need more money for MPGs, we can. If we need more money for outreach, we can. Or if we get another capital improvement project, we can move it. It's going to take a full board vote on it, but it's definitely doable. It's just to, just to get our account moving forward so we can start paying our bills. And then the only asset that we currently have right now is our storage facility, which is at four. 4002 North Mission Road. And that's it. Cool. Are there any questions? Do we have, do we have a motion on the table? Yeah, yeah, motion to approve. Does anybody move? We need to move. move. Okay, so Selena moves. Do we have a second? From the a second. Great, second. Okay, so uh, board member discussion on the budget. Try to make it real brief, if you can. I see no hands up. Any public comment? Public comment on the budget. And keep in mind the uh, <laughs> amounts can be shipped, they'll be shipped around where they can be. Jose Galvez. Jose? Hi, uh, this is Jose. Uh, just as a suggestion, sometimes with some neighborhood councils, they just miss the, the for operational expenses, the website, like if you have any website costs, or uh, especially the, the, the web hosting renewal uh, payments sometimes uh, that occur within the fiscal year, uh, just to consider those factors in uh, when, when, when approving the budget. Okay, cool. Thank you, Jose. Yeah. Um, budget. Vince, micro grants. Now, is that something we'd have to like write into our bylaws? Or? No. It, it's when, when the grant comes up, it can ask for the full amount. And so the council can give to whatever it feels necessary. Example, someone comes for $5,000 for you know, to clean up a park and the council feels that they should only get 2000. So they can, we can set the amount to anything as long as, as long as someone makes a motion and then we can reduce the amount. We can never give more than what's requested. Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, we couldn't like come up with a name for these mini grants, right? No. We so could market something like that if we wanted to. I mean, it's. It's, it's only available to nonprofits and schools. Okay. All right. So we have the motion to approve the budget for 2022-2023. It's been seconded. Okay. Public comment. Uh, anybody? Oh, wait, we already took public. It was Jose. Mm -hmm. All right. So first and second, um, we're going to do a roll call vote on the budget. All right. I will now take the vote. Sarah? Yes. Ben? 
Yes. Chente? Yes. Benny? Yes. Emily? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Didia? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Diego? Yes. Joe? Gil Arevalo? I'm sorry. <laughs> you said Gil. I didn't hear you. Sorry. Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Gil. Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. And Fernanda? Yes. That's 14 yeses. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody, for approving this. Doing the budget today. Uh, all right, so we're going to move on to the next item. Presentations, item number seven. Uh, we have Jessica Swan on the attendee side from DTSC. Okay, so this is item 7A, presentation. Avenue 34 project briefing by DTSC, Department of Toxic Substances Control, presenter Jessica Swan. Community discussion and Q&A. And in our supporting documents, we have um, the flyer that DC, DTSC put out in three languages, Spanish, English, and Chinese. Um, so uh, we're gonna allocate this, how long to this? Uh, 10, mi 10 minutes, 10 minutes? If we can't five, just because of our time constraints. Oh yeah, okay. And then if we can do a couple of minutes in questioning, if we have any. Yeah, public questions. All right, Jessica? All right, I have promoted her to panelist. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me again. My name is Jessica Swan. I am a public participation for the Department of Toxic Substances Control. I work on several projects along the LA River um, in near the Lincoln Heights neighborhood and as well on this Avenue 34 project. Um, I am going to share my screen or two key. It's not allowing me to. This? Second, let me see. And it should be fairly quick. Um, I have a couple of slides for you all this evening and a- You should be able to share now. Thank you. Let's see. Looks good. I'm trying to allow, have it share, but not take up my entire screen. So I apologize. Let me try with the PDF. Sorry, I have 1,000 windows open. Um, okay, we will just try to do it this way. Can you guys still see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. I did change it a little bit right after I sent it to you, Sarah, so I apologize and I will get you an updated one after. Um, hopefully that's big enough for everyone to see. And if it's not, I can try to um, enlarge it. Okay, so the Department of Toxic Substances Control approved the remedial design implementation plan on July 22nd, which included some detailed information about how the cleanup would be performed and the protections for workers in the surrounding community. We distributed a work notice on July 27th uh, which provided details on the start of the environmental work. Um, so 
we also distributed a community update. And so the work notices are distributed along the fence line as well as handed out to um, people or community members and businesses that could see the site. It's a little bit extended for this project. So those get handed out uh, fairly widely relatively. Um, and we distributed a community update um, to accompany the work notice and provide further information about the project status and next steps. You should have received that in your mailboxes uh, yesterday and as well as in the email in email format if you guys are on our email list um, on August 2nd. And so if you guys, if anybody would like to join our email list, I will display my um, contact information shortly. So, Head of um, school starting at Hillside Elementary on August 15th. The proponent of um, the cleanup will be excavating three relatively small areas along Pasadena Avenue. These are the um, metals contaminated areas. So it's going to be this green area, this um, yellow area, and this yellow and blue area. And so the differentiation between those is that um, this green area is for um, chromium, hexavalent chromium, which was found in that area. The yellow is arsenic and the uh, bluish color here is for is the def definition of the lead contamination. So that's um, this particular image. Um, so again, those are along Pasadena Avenue. So they want to start with those before um, school begins on August 15th and get that all completed. Um, some of the preparations for this began on August 1st and that included demolition, um, which is not you know, under necessarily under DTSC cleanup process, but we were on site to monitor those activities. Um, we, there were also air monitors, which were um, installed upwind and downwind and next to, um, or, and then one will be next to the excavation area. And that is just hey, compliance with the community air monitoring plan. Um, so the proponent will complete a geophysical survey of the entire site. They will be done in phases as access to different areas of the site become available. So these three areas, um, that they have removed the concrete from, they'll do those first. And then as other areas become available, then they'll do the geophysical survey of those. A geophysical survey is used to find any previously, um, any sources of any previously undiscovered releases. So um, details about the upcoming work are posted on the proponent's website. Right now um, they have, let me go to that screen really quickly. Um, Right now they have a schedule of the different activities that are going to be completed, what's gonna be completed and kind of which, which days. Um, and so that is the first link right here. Um, the, another place where you guys can obtain information from is the EnviroStore page for the Avenue 34 site. That's this third link. And then also the DTSC Avenue 34 website. My contact information is here. Um, Reese Davis um, is the project manager, he's still the same project manager. Um, he just has two last names. And so um, his last name is actually Davis. And the, um, you know, sometimes when you're working for the state of California, the way that we set up our emails can be a little um, tricky. So he wanted to go by his actual last name. So, um, Okay, truck routes, um, this is the, the image of what um, we have at this time. It's in the RDIP. It does show all routes along Avenue 34. However, no contaminated soil will be um, hauled along this route. That is um, an agreement that is in writing in the remedial design implementation plan also known as RDIP. And so um, that I know that that was a concern that was held also 
um, for the soil stockpiles for the three particular areas that I showed in the beginning. Um, those excavations, their shallow soil, those were go are going to be direct loaded onto trucks. So there won't be any soil stockpiling for that area, but there will be soil stock piling as the excavation moves into other areas. Um, and those are, will not be, the stockpiles will not be along Avenue 34 or Pasadena. Um, they will be away from the fence line. Um, so the air monitoring stations, again, they're placed, um, they're placed upwind and downwind and then generally near the excavation site. Um, they monitor for the total dust, um, so just the amount of all the dust that's, that might be generated. Um, they also monitor for metals, including arsenic, um, the hexavalent chromium and lead, as well as um, the volatile organic compounds. Um, the proponent will start preparing the site for the SBE pilot test. Um, and so this first image here is um, the design for the sampling plan to start the SVE system. Um, so we expect to provide you all with further updates as the project moves along and we are going to um, get to major milestones. If you guys have any specific requests of when you want updates, um, please let me know. Otherwise, we were um, we intend to notify again when the SBE pilot, when the SBE system changes from a pilot test to what it's actually going to be, as well as when prior to the large excavation area, um, which is here. And let me see. Oh, okay. So the final cleanup goal, um, the goal at this time is unrestricted. However, if um, the proponent for some reason isn't able, I mean, that's that's the goal of, that we're at right now. Um, there may be other future uh, mitigation or remediation techniques that are implemented in order to ensure that the safety of the um, future occupants. So, um, oh, and DTSC will be on site regularly to provide oversight. And that's. I have for you all this evening. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for your presentation. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to open it up to public questions uh, for Jessica. Um, if there's anybody from the public who wants to ask a question or dialogue or Q and A, uh, please raise your hand or press star nine. We have Michael. Henry Hayden. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so I just wanna say that um, uh, we still have serious objections to this cleanup plan, which doesn't do enough to clean up this toxic waste dump. Uh, toxic vapors have been identified at extremely high levels and this system that DTSC approved to extract them is deeply flawed. The spacing for the extractors is set at every 100 feet around the perimeter of the property rather than the more standard spacing of every 20 feet where contamination is the highest. And a pilot test should already have been performed before this plan was approved so that the details could be informed by the specific characteristic of the site itself rather than already assuming what the plan will include. Also, the most recent draft of this plan, the RDIP um, as they call it, uh, removed important language that originally called for moving the vapor extraction units to any newly identified concentrations of toxins to remove those toxins directly. I found this by doing a side-by-side -side comparison in Adobe Acrobat of the first and second drafts of this plan. And the new language is much weaker, saying that the team will discuss options for dealing with newly identified concentrations as long as it doesn't impede with the footprint of the construction moving forward. I hope you can all understand how disturbing that is because it means that if they find new vapors underneath the buildings, they won't necessarily be required to remove them like they would have been under the previous uh, plan. This makes us feel that this vapor extraction system is designed more to silence the community rather than to robustly remove as much toxic material as they could. We also learned that the developers have 
already intended to install a vapor mitigation system under the building more than two years ago, which is strange since they had insisted then that the site was not contaminated. Um, and the community hired a scientist to review this plan. And he pointed out that this system will only be underneath the parking lot underneath half of two of the buildings and almost not at all under the third building. And that seems really highly irresponsible even just for their future tenants. Um, the measures described by DTSC tonight don't resolve our neighborhood's main concerns with the site. And they don't address the concerns raised by our elected leaders, including US Representative Jimmy Gomez, County Supervisor Hilda Solis. Uh, we still don't know how far the contamination from the site may have already spread into the community. DTSC is not requiring the developers to investigate that. There are still large quantities of contaminated land and potentially contaminated soil that will be left in place across the site after the cleanup. DTSC's cleanup plan still only covers less than a third of all the soil that the developers will be excavating. And we believe that all excavated should be subject to DTSC's oversight since this was a former toxic waste dump. DTSC has still not required a human health assessment before or during this cleanup so that none of us have a clear picture of the dangers we may be exposed to during the cleanup or that we already have been exposed to. And most importantly, the final cleanup goals are 30 times less stringent than federal residential safety standards. This is something that the US EPA has called inappropriate for a residential project. This is a toxic waste dump, so DTSC should be following all of their own guidelines, which they're not doing, and aggressively requiring the most of these developers who will be making huge profits by building this project in our neighborhood. We will continue to demand the DTSC take the safety of our community seriously and follow all of their own guidelines for toxic plume investigations and cleanup. And I, I do have one question for Jessica Swan. Um, you know, the newest language in these documents say that the goal is for unrestricted use. Um, previous documents have said made references to possible um, land use covenants. Um, will these, or do you still expect land use covenants to be in place um, despite the goal of unrestricted use? So unrestricted use, if the goal for, if the goal is met, that means that the cleanup levels are safe for, for residences, for hospitals, for daycares, things like that. So that's generally what that term means. If that goal is achieved, none of the none of the other med mitigation measures would be necessary, such as a the VIM, uh, the vapor intrusion mitigation system, which is essentially um, a barrier and also sometimes a um, an extraction system that takes the um, vapors out of the soil, um, so a dual system. And then, so none of those would be necessary if the unrestricted um, goals are met. So that's what they're trying to get at is a, a situation where they those protective barriers that I just described only going under half the building anyway, where they wouldn't even install those at all. Is that is that what you're saying? If the cleanup goals meet the unrestricted level, correct, no other mitigation measures would be necessary because they have met the, the screening levels for those, for the contaminants that are found on site. Um, okay. Michael? Can you guys he hear me? I can hear you. I, I think I was just muted there. Um, yeah, well, I just want to reiterate that, you know, all the things that we have been calling for since the beginning, uh, community testing, um, you know, human health assessment um, have not been performed and have not been required by DTSC. And DTSC is still making no requirement for those things. We know that the property adjacent to this between the site and the railroad, which is like a 15 foot wide strip of land. Um, DTSC has records of that property being highly contaminated, including by PCBs. And that's all in documents that the developers have supplied to DTSC. Um, so we still wanna see the results of that. And we wanna make sure that um, not only is this, this site, you know, the project site itself cleaned up to safe standards, but that none of this contamination surrounding the project site is continuing to be a threat to our community. And, and this current plan does nothing to address those things.
Thank you for your comment. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, are there any other public comments? Please raise your hand or press star nine. Any public comments? Running every 34 development, breaking ground. <clears throat> I don't see any. I have a public comment. So there's an, a council file that's been updated. It's uh, 21 0491 215 West College Street, Blossom Plaza, TF Broadway Limited Partnership, 942 North Broadway. So there's a public private partnership going on with Kevin Ratner at Blossom Plaza. Um, the city negotiated the development of Blossom Plaza, which is on city owned land. On 215 West College through a ground lease with Far City Blossom. Super weird. Uh, oh my God. There's so many entities, right? Shangri La is in, uh, involved in this as well. So it's a lot of the same players that are at 34. It's about installing some sort of crane and then juristic, you know, them being able to use public property, public land. Um, <clears throat> How do we access the litigation files from 1985 from a uh, city attorney that were shredded? Does anybody know? Vince, is it possible to like email an ex city attorney? Were they allowed to keep copies of files? There are a few out there, but you know, they're all players in the game, some of them. The last ones I knew, they either passed away or not. That's why they got rid of a lot of the documentation. It's happening every day now in the city. Uh, these things are so important to the history. I mean, you know what's detrimental when we listen to these conversations is the city and the state have no written history on these properties. Yet, most of these properties you could never develop on. Even the city at some point was saying no. And now all of a sudden with the change of readaptive reuse, the state magically waves a wand over it and says, hey, these, are, these lands can be remediated. We can change the, the standard of contamination to fit these developments. No, it's all driven by money. Well, uh, you know, Ed Reyes earmarked this property in a motion from 2006. It was with the Metro, you know, when he was doing the Metro. And it's um, the identification of uh, Metro Gold Line and Heritage Square adjacent properties. They identified the Avenue 34 site the uh, Nila Plaza site, and then the site where that Fig Earth place is, you know, on, on Figaro, uh, to be exempt from the CASP and uh, height restrictions. They can exceed density and height restrictions just because they're uh, close to Heritage Square. So the city's been sitting on these properties forever. Uh, Mike Hernandez initiated the tearing down of the old Walsh's property. It's like, Everybody's involved. The 254 barrels of toxic waste buried, prosecuted by the city attorney of L LA in 1985, and Barry Groveman of Prop 65. These files are gone. It's such an intentional erasure of information. It's a crime. Uh, I don't know what our recourse is, but um, uh, Michael Hayden? Yes. So uh, at the uh, city planning uh, department downtown or whatever at Spring Street, they have like uh, files of documents ar that aren't archived online, correct? That's right. And you know, I did a public records act request for some of those documents. One of the documents I found um, was, you know, I found some documents where there were, you know, sort of like uh, proposed plan amendments for a neighborhood and public comments that were given about this block specifically, people saying they knew it was contaminated oh, and, yeah. and raising concerns with that. Um, I also found a letter from Gil Cedillo in 2017 when the first iteration of this project at Avenue 34 was proposed and our council member wrote a letter to city planning requesting specifically to exempt the required public hearing for this project. Now, those other hearings for stuff in this neighborhood had shown that people in the neighborhood knew about contamination on this block. 
And, and the, the fact that the city approved an exemption for public hearings for this required, a required public hearing for this project stopped people in the neighborhood from raising those concerns all the way back in 2017. Um, another thing I found when I went downtown was that all the, all the you know, general plan amendments that have allowed for this, the most recent general plan amendment for this area, um, and which specifically required, by the way, um, DTSC to approve any development on this parcel of land, um, I wanted to find a copy of that general plan amendment and I couldn't find it. And uh, city planning says they don't have a record of it. Um, this is really bizarre because, or if, rather for the environmental review for that general plan amendment. They have the general plan amendment. They don't well, have the environmental review for it. Here was um, the I can't even find evidence that it ever was performed. I can find a, a sheet that's got the uh, proposed environmental review, but not the actual final document or any evidence that it ever existed. What year was it, Michael? 2006? Uh, 2006 or 2007. Was that when Michael Logrand was at LA uh, City Planning? He's a big uh, cast sure. guy. Vince, was Michael Logrand uh, the Vince Bertoni at the time? I think right. right. Very, uh, uh, whatever, uh, whatever. Scandal. Sure. We have Melanie's hand. She's been up for a yeah, while. Yeah, Mel. No. Take over. Hey, sorry. Um, I'm concerned about this, uh, the goals being met and then there be no need for like this. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time like remembering all this, having a hard time tonight. Um, the vapor intrusion part, like not having to like play a part anymore um, because these goals that DTSC, they've changed, like, right, like these goals are unacceptable. So you guys are reaching these goals that don't protect anyone in order to then further like not protect our community. Um, and I, I wanted to know um, why DTSC has uh, such disdain for our community and why we are being um, treated like this uh, and why like federal officials and why scientists and why community members are continually ignored and why DTSC thinks that they know better than all of us um, and why why they continue not to listen to us and also roll back on protections for us. Um, so if I could get like a clear answer on that and acknowledgement of that and not like a very vague roundabout um, description about what's being done or what's not being done, I'd really appreciate it at this point. So the unrestricted standard is not, it's not just for this property. So the unrestricted standard is different for each different chemical because they're all different, right? Um, so those, though, that's the standard that they, that us and the proponent are, are wanting to achieve, right? The unrestricted level, which is considered um, safe by our experts by, you know, it just, it, depending on what um, chemical it is, it might be our standard. Um, it might be a, um, a different standard if we haven't set one particularly. So, um, I mean, we can talk more about the different chemicals and the different standards and what those mean um, in like maybe a separate meeting because I don't know that we have time for that um, or that I have the full capacity and knowledge of all the different chemicals and their levels to, to deliver on that. Um, but the goal would be unrestricted and that would, that's not just for your community. That's not directed at you guys. That's this for the safety of the environment and for the safety of your community as well. Um, so I'm hoping that that was direct and straightforward and let me know if you need some further details on that. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I have another question if I could. Hold on, M Michael, we have Anna Lee next. Oh, sure. And then when, when, let's try to give everyone a chance because we've been talking for a oh, while. Guys, yeah, it's 721. Gil, are you going to have to go to your class soon? Anyway, uh, sorry to interrupt. Let's continue. But uh, I'm not going to interrupt anymore. Oh, I just want to I just wanted to ask, you know, um, 
like would you personally feel comfortable with like if you were if you were in our situation jessica would you feel like hey this is totally cool like no big deal no problem what aspect are you referring to i mean i believe my expert um, colleagues are more than capable of of doing their jobs and so um it's okay don't we don't need to waste this time anyway sorry yeah i will just uh, push through because uh it's just going to be a same uh, answers like we usually get thank you so much jessica like always all right thank you, thank you. okay i just i what? just wanted another one and then michael can close it off yeah yeah jessica uh, you know we've i've known jessica for a while i've seen her in pastel del rio and all these projects right DTSC has a horrible history in the, in California right now protecting uh, the health, safety, and welfare of the people. Jessica, I think what Annalie was going towards and what you were going towards was like these chemicals. So let's pick lead. Lead is on the ground right now. It's in the report. You just put it on the presentation. Does the state have an acceptable level of lead that the average person or child can be exposed to without causing any harm? There is none. Yet the state right now, the DTS and these experts and these, you know, academia people and these smart people, you know what? I've seen California do some really dumb stuff and I've seen it in court during litigation. This is one of them. What's gonna happen when that dust rises as it is rising now and you're exposing it to all of the children in the neighborhood? That's why you have air monitors. When those air, air monitors detect lead, and keep in mind, lead it does not have a safe level. I get tired of hearing this from the city and the state that there's acceptable levels of lead. There is not. You can go to any pediatrician, he'll tell you that. When that lead hits those monitors and it's detected, will the state be ready to shut down the project? Or are you going to use a loophole like you created, like Michael uh, stated, in which you're just going to go back into a dark room and you're going to pretend nothing happened? And you're going to give us the runaround that the state sometimes cannot intervene into the city and the city wants to do what it wants to do. You all must remember that you have fiduciary duties to protect the health, safety, and welfare. When you don't do that, you become as guilty as any of these people that can contaminate. And yes, city, state, and federal agencies can also be polluters too especially when they're not obligated to protect the people and the residents that pay your salaries. So it definitely looks that you guys are just going to developers say, look, let's get this through. We don't care the city's pressuring us, the state's pressuring us. You know, that's when you guys have something called the whistleblower law. And you guys should be blowing like a steam train, but we don't see that. And that makes you complacent to the issues that are facing our communities right now. Remember one thing, these are our children. They will have disorders from that lead for their entire life that they're being exposed to now because you guys are playing political games. And Pacel de Real shouldn't happen for the same reason. It's another huge toxic site that affects our community. Keep that in mind, Jessica. I know you're the messenger. I don't, I don't want you to take it personal, but think about it. When you're complacent to these things, this is how we feel in our community. It's been happening too long. Thank you. Thank you. I have one last comment before I take it over to Michael. Um, thank you for that, Chente. I second that. Not only does it make you complacent, but in my opinion, it makes you an accomplice. Um, being that I have been following and speaking up against this issue from the very beginning, yet seeing the same rhetoric being used, and the fact that um, uh, this project is moving forward, um, I'm going to ask the same questions. Um, have you reached out to the residents and neighbors that live directly across the street from uh, Avenue 34? Because they have health issues. Have you reached out to them about that? We have previously pointed that out to you. Uh, you're the public participation specialist and a public member pointed out last time that you have only reached out to less than 2% of our community and therefore not engaging in a valuable conversation. Um, in regards to the RDIP, as pointed out by Michael, the manipulation and erasure of information is criminal. Um, the language revolving around mitigation and when it will end 
proves that DTSC's role here isn't to resolve the contamination issue, it's to expedite this project. Um, and our community has been speaking up against this from the very beginning. Our community is being poisoned. Um, and all I'm seeing is complacency. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Michael. Um, I just wanna say thank you to the, the neighborhood council and thank you to uh, Vincent and Fernanda for your last two comments. I, I don't have anything to add beyond that right now. Thank you, Michael. Um, are there any other comments? I don't see any hands raised. Oh, wait, there's one attendee. And uh, we have the uh, sort of flyers in our supporting documents with the contact info for DTSC. Okay, that's Michael's hand. Um, thank you, Jessica, for presenting. Thank you all for having me and allowing, giving me the space to present for you all. Um, I should be, uh, hope to see you all soon when we have future updates. All right, thanks a lot. All right. And now, uh, we're going to, uh, this, the sewer briefing, item number 7B, we're going to uh, save for next meeting. Um, we're going to move on to item 7C. This is a presentation by the Lincoln Heights Chamber of Commerce, uh, President Steve Kasten of Lincoln Heights. Oh, he's the presenter. I guess you're also the president. Steve? So this is a community discussion and Q&A. Steve wants to present the Chamber of Commerce. It's been around since 1934. I have promoted Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, hey. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, speak to you this evening. I wanna thank uh, President Sarah and the Board of Directors of the Neighborhood Council. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, I, I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, the Chamber and tell you that our two organizations definitely should work together. It's, our goals are the same, the betterment of our community. Uh, of course, the Lincoln Heights Chamber of Commerce is a business association, but it's much more than, than that in Lincoln Heights. To tell you about how old the chamber is, it was founded in 1916. So it's over a hundred years old, well over. And it, the, the, what I heard the history, it's either the LA Chamber or Lincoln Heights Chamber were the oldest chambers in the area. I think we were. So I discovered the chamber in the 1980s. I was in business in Lincoln Heights. And the first thing I noticed with their slogan was, unity builds the community. For me, that said it all. So I got involved in the community and, uh, Again, I'm gonna tell you that the chamber is a business organization, but when we started recruiting members and having community meetings, all of a sudden we saw people coming to our monthly luncheons. Our membership consisted of uh, residents, business people, nonprofits, educators, senior citizens, service clubs, nonprofits we would have anywhere from 50 to 100 people coming to luncheons every month. When we invited a uh, political person and we wanted on the agenda, they, they pretty much always came. And I can tell you, we had our local uh, elected officials, we had Congress people, US senators. I mean, everybody was part of the community. And those were the days that I wish we could get back. You could talk to someone right there at a luncheon, live luncheons, and get people united. Now, the chamber had been inactive for several years. 
the last active years of the chamber were in 2011, 2012, and 2013, when the chamber raised $53,000 for high school students to attend college. We had our, our dinners called Entrepreneur Scholarship Fundraising Dinners. That's a long time ago. After those years, the chamber was pretty inactive until this year. So I can tell you from my heart, we can't always agree. We know that. But we can meet to discuss community issues and plan to work together for the good of our, and I use the word you've used it, I, a beloved community of Lincoln Heights. It really is. So compromise can bring us together. And the slogan, I'm going to repeat it again, remember our slogan, unity builds the community. And when we get divided, the community loses. So we should never be divided by anybody. Sometimes it happens at, uh, from our political leaders. I mean, I've heard the term divide and conquer. No, we're not doing that. We want to be united. So my last final comments, we must protect and help our local business community. We have never had so many vacant commercial storefronts on North Broadway. And I submit to you why. It's a big question. We must protect and preserve our commercial business corridors. The commercial quarters must be safe and clean and attractive to shoppers of our businesses. And the last serious comment, make no mistake, Parking lots are essential to the success of businesses. And I can tell you a lot of businesses have decided not to have their business here because of the fear of losing their parking lots to housing. So I'm gonna tell you again, my name is Steve Caston. I'm a community stakeholder. I'm president of the Lincoln Heights Chamber of Commerce. And I'm a business person at 2718 North Broadway. I'm in the real estate business. I've been here 42 years. I'm not an absentee business person. I'm here every day. And I want to work with our neighborhood council, our chamber, and any other groups that sincerely want to work together. Let's not fight each other. Let's help each other. So basically, and I, I really appreciate, I've been in conversation with Sarah, which I appreciate. And you know, Nancy, Nancy Soto came by my office. I wish she was on the, on the board tonight. I could tell her that lady has so much enthusiasm. We need to bottle that and use it. So I appreciate she came to the office, introduced herself to me, and I really appreciate it. My office is open. I'm here five days a week, sometimes six days a week. 2718 North Broadway, our office is between Workman and Sitchell. We're in the De Blasi building. And if you haven't been in that building, you really should visit. It was built 1931 by an Italian family. Don't forget this community one time was predominantly Italian. We've gone through stages. So the original owners built it in 1931. I'm the only second owner of the property. It's a magnificent building. If you go upstairs, we have marble stairs, tile, tile on the walls and floor, all imported from Italy. And it's all original. And I'd rather be in this building than any building anywhere. And I told someone today, I had a chance to um, move to Beverly Hills. Someone offered me a wonderful deal. And I turned it down. This is my community. It's your community. Let's make it better. Let's make it safer. Let's make it business friendly. And if anybody can tell me why we have so many vacancies, I'd like to hear the answer. Because there's something wrong. In 40 years of being in Lincoln Heights, I've never seen so many vacancies. I think we need a task force from the Chamber, Neighborhood Council, and anybody else. Let's figure it out. And let's, let's support our local businesses. And we've lost a lot of business to Glendale, to Alhambra, 
let's keep it here and help the community. So I'm, I'm telling you though, one more time, let's work together. And thank you for allowing me to uh, speak to you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. If any questions, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Um, yeah, any uh, board members, do you have questions for Steve? Uh, maybe just short little questions about the Chamber of Commerce, Esmeralda? Uh, actually, never mind. I'm gonna put my hand down. Any other uh, questions? Yes, yeah, Steve, I was looking up the past presidents, you know. So the, I would have to say the thing that's changed is that you used to have the mom and pop lifelong store owners, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I have uh, Ernest Oates, Ernie, Faber K. Ames, Billy Moore Knox, he was the owner of the airliner. Mm -hmm. uh, Wolf from Wolf and Sons, and then Roy Wolsey. He was uh, president. Um, yeah, so these are all like, you know, they had their shops for like, what, 60 years or whatever. So we've lost that. We've lost. You mentioned Wolsey Brothers. I knew Roy Wolsey. He was the president of the Lincolnites Chamber when I first opened up my business. And the history of the Woolsey Brother Hardware Store is amazing. There are three brothers. They supported the uh, Boys and Girls Club. They were right next door. And I heard stories of Roy Woolsey paying the electric bill for the, for the club. They were totally immersed in this community. So the first people I met were Roy Woolsey, Connie Destito, Ralph Fierro. These are the, these are the people that built this community. It was never a major corporation, all small business people. So when I came in, I said, this is where I want to be. We didn't have to worry about corporations taking over. We had our businesses here. They served this community well. Uh, like in, I'll give you an instance, in our building, when I came here, there was a dentist upstairs. And this is a building without an elevator. It's a dentist up there and a chiropractor. Imagine walking upstairs to a chiropractor. Well, their grandfather did, and they didn't need elevators. And there's been a dentist in this building since 1947. Dr. Uh, Lopez is up there now. And one of the sad things to hear him tell me, and you have to be aware of this, that his patients are afraid to come to Lincoln Heights. The parking lot behind our building, it's a city parking lot, is uh, homeless shelters are set up there and they take all the parking away. And I'm the last one to say we don't need to help. Of course, we need to house everybody. We need to do it. And that should be the job of our elected officials. Why hasn't it been done? And there's a question I don't think any of us can answer. I can speculate but we need the parking lots for business. So my last comment, those parking lots are crucial. Royal Vista Health Clinic. If you go to that lot, people are afraid to go in there. There's no parking. There's no parking in a lot of lots. House those people, help them. What are we doing to solve that problem? So it's at the expense of business. When you start losing businesses, that's a sign of decay of a community. You don't want that to happen. So we want to do the right thing. And for me, I've been involved in the chamber all these years. We're, we're a good organization. We really are. And you're a good organization if we work together. And why can't we do that? Don't we have the same goals? So my goal, obviously, is the business community. I hate to see all these vacancies. And to have a dentist tell me after a dentist being in there since 1947, he's, a, he's, he's losing his patients. Not his patients, the patients that come to the office. And then I hear Royal Vista. I've heard the story that doctors don't want to work there. They drive in the community. They feel unsafe. That's a terrible feeling. And for us, we're a real estate office. We don't have anything worth stealing, yet we have to have a buzzer on. We have to buzz people in. Our office door is locked. And it's the last thing I wanna see in this community. 
And there are dangerous people out there. Besides the people that need housing, they are still dangerous people. So I want our community back. I am very, very upset with where we are right now. So can we work together? Can we solve the problem? And I, again, I appreciate Sarah and I have been talking and Nancy Soto and I have been talking. Can we all talk? Can we, who did uh, the saying, can we all get along? Two I words, can't... two words or four words, Lincoln Heights Mini Mall. Okay, I, I'm familiar with that. The There was a mini mall on, uh, Wait, uh, point of order. Broadway. Can I point of order? Is Work that okay? Broadway. Excuse uh, me. It was a mini mall. Okay. One, second, one second, Steve. Uh, yeah, Mel. I'm not sure how point of orders works. So I apologize if I'm doing this wrong, but I'm concerned okay, that wait, our. Is, um, is that what? I have to ask, what is your point? And My point I is sorry, is there a way to stop derailing the council with um, these stories so we can have like a, a productive conversation about why there's so many vacancies and also maybe stop calling our community members dangerous? I, I just, uh, I, I, this is, is kind of dragging. Well, okay. Uh, so Vince, um, with we, we don't have a business committee. We have a programs and services committee. Vince, uh, if there, we were to expound on this present, um, talk more about ideas, what committee would this be? Um, why, 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 am, why did I hear that statement? You learn from history. If you don't learn from history, you make the same mistakes. I'm bringing up history that was good for the community. And a resident that is coming at me and he's come up with me with a metal rod, that's a resident I should make friends with? No, that's not a resident. That's someone that needs help. So you criticizing me for saying that? Sarah, I, we should let the committee members go because they have their hands up. I think Melanie, yeah. were you done with your comment? No, I, I have a comment that I've been okay. waiting. Yeah. Is it now a good time? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I, I, I had a couple questions first um, uh, for Mr. Kasten. Um, I think you're in real estate. Um, do you own buildings in Lincoln Heights? Um, and you own uh, buildings that have businesses in them. And what are you doing, um, you know, in order to support those businesses as far as like rents and um, making sure that they're affordable for local mom and pop businesses. And also I, I do just, I really, uh, again, I had a problem earlier this meeting. I don't like the way that our community is being categorized. Um, our unhoused community members are still community members. They live here just like we do. Uh, they're not dangerous individuals. Um, I know that maybe people need to be buzzed into businesses. The same thing goes for businesses in Beverly Hills. This is not, this is not, you know, only Lincoln Heights where this occurs. And um, I really don't like to sit here and listen to our community members that we represent be referred to as dangerous over and over and over again um, during anecdotal stories that really have no substance behind them. Besides historically, I understand that they're important. It's great to hear about, but this is a, a board meeting and make some action. So I'd like to focus more on that. But if you could answer the question about what you're doing for current businesses that are in buildings that you potentially own, I, I'd be interested to hear about that. We own and manage, that's our business. We have tenants in very, very, very low income apartments. We actually have tenants in one bedroom apartments paying under $600 a month. We are not a corporation that is making tons of money off of this community. We don't do that. And I challenge you to visit our tenants and talk to them. So we're the person in business, in the community. We're not a corporation in Beverly Hills. So for you to even say that to me is a, is a, is a slap in my face. We have tenants again, it's $600 a month. You're gonna criticize me? Thank you, Stephen. Um, Diego? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, uh, yikes, how do I talk? Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, Stephen, I, I'd really appreciate you coming uh, to our council meeting today. Um, I am really interested in understanding more about how the Chamber of Commerce works now. 
does it function like our, our neighborhood council wherein any business owner could serve on the committee and, and make decisions? How, is, how are decisions made? Um, can any community member go to these meetings? And also my last question is, you keep mentioning wanting to work together with our council. How do you exactly envision that? Um, what, what are the probable next steps that you foresee us supporting um, should we decide to do that? All right, those are valid questions. Um, the Chamber of Commerce is open to anybody. Anybody can come to our meetings, it's open. In the past, we've had committees just like you do that want to do serve on the board at different capacities. So it's a hundred year old chamber. We didn't, we, I didn't invent it. It was already invented. We just followed up. Now you say, how can we work together? Maybe you have a representative from the council business representative meet with us. Let's do a study. Let's find out why these storefronts are empty. I mean, that's a question I can't even answer. And I've been here a long time. When you have an empty storefronts, what's the reason? I don't know. So let's do a study. Let's find out. Thank you. Fernanda? Hi. Um, I, there's a, a lot, a lot of um, thoughts going through my head. Um, in regards to the white elephant in the room of why are all these storefronts empty, um, there has been research done in terms of the effects of gentrification, specifically for our communities on Broadway. There ha um, I would love to pioneer <laughs> research for that. Um, but essentially what's happening here is that our community is being displaced in many different aspects and businesses is one of the ways that we are being displaced, specifically businesses that don't cater to our community, businesses that are displacing mom and pop shops, um, developers and corporations buying out buildings and um, skyrocketing the rent of local business mom and pop shops, and therefore they leave. Um, and so I do think it's valid for the members of our board um, to ask uh, specifically what um, you as a property owner do for your tenants, because we've seen how poorly a lot of our tenants have been treated. We aren't accusing you of that, we, we are asking. And, and I do think that, you know, Melanie's questions were totally valid. I think they were maybe misinterpreted. Um, I, I also do want to say that um, if you look at Broadway now, um, what businesses are the ones thriving? Who has the line around the corner? And that's Tejuino Reyes. Um, our community members support each other. Um, our immigrant community, we're 70% of the economy of California. Um, we just don't have the opportunities to own a storefront. And when we do, we are quickly displaced. Um, and so for me, in order to preserve the history of Lincoln Heights, which I also very much value, um, specifically the indigenous and immigrant history that has happened here in Lincoln Heights. For me, the only way to move forward is to invest in our people. To me, that does not mean investing in gentrifying businesses that do not cater to our community and will continue to displace not only our history and culture, but our people as well. And as I don't know if you've been listening to the entire meeting, but we have developers that are building on poisonous land in Lincoln Heights. The life of our community members doesn't seem to matter to anybody. Um, and so for me, that's where my priority is. We have people in Lincoln Heights that have been here for decades that are worthy of businesses. We need to invest in our own people. Um, not specifically in our properties, 
um, but our people. I don't know if that is clear, if any of that makes sense. Um, but I, I do think it's important in the rhetoric that we use when we speak about our communities, because as someone that has lived here pretty much my entire life, um, we are criminalized a lot. We are belittled all the time. Um, being brown, being immigrant, being working class, being low income automatically stigmatizes you in these communities. Um, and when that happens, that's when the dehumanization happens. That's when we're displaced. That's when we're poisoned. That's when we're not invested in as human beings. And so for me, um, when it comes to the business aspect of gentrification, I care about the price point of these businesses. Who are they catering to? Who are the business owners? Are they locals from Lincoln Heights or are they New York transplants? Um, and what are they selling? Is it for our community or is it not? And um, our community's needs absolutely matter. Um, I'll just say it again. What are the businesses thriving in Lincoln Heights right now? It's our local POC businesses because that's where the need is and um, that's, that's where the support is. Um, and thank you for your time, Stephen. Thank you for having me. I'll, I'll be glad to answer any other questions. Anybody has anything? <clears throat> yeah. So my family has a long history here, Steve. We come from the three destroyed communities by a corporation near Dodger Stadium. In our communities, we owned homes. We had businesses. We had a thriving community. But there's racist policies that a lot of times people say, why don't people, why do people react today the way they do to government and the police department, right? One of the primary reasons, because most of you guys haven't been exposed to what we've gone through. Okay, we have inherited trauma from a long time ago. Even just hearing the word ownership or real estate and owning land when the land before was indigenous. It's a colonialistic mindset to sit back and think you, that people can capitalize and turn around and then exploit the very same people you've exploited for generations. That's why I remind people, my grandma reminds me every day about her hard work, just like we talk about the American dream how she had to get up every morning with my grandfather and, and my aunt and my uncles uh, to get work so they could buy their piece of the American dream, only to have it snatched away by the very government that keeps telling us that we need to wait and we need to work together and we need to sit down and talk about policies. Those, are, those policies are very traumatic. They're very traumatic in, in land. And the one thing that exists more in Lincoln Heights than anything is greed the exploitation of the people that are here as their, as their resources leave. We did a study in 2011 to today on the largest migration of people from Hollywood to the, to the East, all driven through economics. You don't have to look far to see what's going to happen to Lincoln Heights. You could just go to Echo Park. You can go to Silver Lake and you can go to Hollywood. Most of the old way of living, including family homes has been decided a long time ago that that's not the case anymore. And you should know that in real estate right now, most of these communities are being bought up, multiple, multiple uh, single home houses are being bought up and they're being turned into units. California is getting turned into 100% rent, which is slavery in a lot of ways. And that comes from the powers of the real estate agents. And also, and I'm not saying you, but real estate people that have organized with crooked politicians. And if people want to doubt that, just look at City Hall right now. Four of our current council members right now are inactive because of real estate crooked deals. How do we compete against that? How do we sit with the very people that are destroying our communities every day? Every day. To not step up to them and voice it in opposition. To, to sit there and say, please don't do it to me. Caspin, they, they've been doing this for over 100 years that they've never met the housing needs of our people purposefully 
the documentation there is in history. The average citizen is fed up. The average citizen does not want to look at that business model unless the business model is going to be directed by them. And that's hard for businessmen. I know that. Okay. I've been in that sector where I've seen how they react to these types of discussions and they don't like it. They want a free market. Well, look outside your window. That's what a free market causes when you have people that are really not free. It's an exploitation of it. Now, it's admirable of you to have the rents, and maybe you're the only one that does that. But I tell people, we need more. And at some point, what needs to have, ha what needs to have happen is you need to clear out the city. You need newly elected officials. You cannot be asking people who already have these things set 20 years. That's why we did the study in 2011. Everybody was in, their hand was in the cookie jar from business, specifically real estate. Ron Elmer in Echo Park, you might have known him. One of the crookedest guys, Jackie Goldberg. That's why the bids are so destructive to our people. And people feel it. They may not understand completely what they're feeling, but they feel it. You can't go into a store and pay for a $50 haircut. You can't go in there and pay for a $15 sandwich. It comes down to the number. And you know as well as I do as a businessman is that those numbers are going to equate to the economy that's out there. Nobody can give affordable food without going broke. And that's something that we would face in Lincoln Heights. How could we do that? How could we actually open up a store that can give cheaper produce that somebody could actually buy for their family so they don't have to pick like a lot of people say, why do we eat junk food and why is there beer on every corner? That's all you make affordable. People do want to eat healthy, but they need the choices and they need them to be affordable. That is not provided by the state, the federal government, anybody. And trust me on this, the generational harm that they have done, the city and corporations to my personal family, is what has happened to a lot of people, whether they're renters or not, or homeowners. It's tragic. It's in our neighborhood. And it's only going to get worse when these things are vacant because we are, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know what part of real estate you're in or what meetings you attend. If you don't attend the, the big corporate meetings that talk about this, because they're actually talking about it. There's a lot of records when people go to these, these real estate on the development and upswing of properties in the neighborhoods, they have risen dramatically in price because they're up for demolishing. They're up to redo it, rezone and all these crazy things we're seeing. There's a lot we're up against, but there's a very bad history with the politics, with the bids, and a lot of other things that you need to be aware of coming in. And that's what this community has. Take it into consideration because even members on your, on your committee right now have very, very strong, um, uh, people feel very strongly about them for the positions they took on the homeless and on gentrification. And that's another thing that we have to look into on how we can let people on, the, just like we hold accountable our elected officials, we need to hold accountable even people on our bids. They're a great influence. But the people are angry, the people are frustrated, and they're tired. And that is unity. That is community coming together. And, what, and what, what people see today in the uprising is exactly that. It may not be traditional. It may not even be civil in some cases. But that should be an indicator of the frustration of the people of Lincoln Heights and the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. I just have one thing to say. I made a list of like 300 businesses from Lincoln Heights in like the past 100 years, and it's incredible. It's like incredible. And uh, all the businesses are gone, right? <clears throat> but then, uh, yeah, so I was like, researching and it's like across the whole country it's like all mom and pops are gone since the 70s they just dropped it's like, i guess it's 1982 antitrust laws right and corporate mergers and consolidation that fix the prices so a mom and pop can't sell as cheap as a walmart you know and that's the issue um and then opportunity zones and adaptive reuse and cdos and speculators and um it's there are solutions. It's like one of the greatest things, like one of the most beloved things that's missed is the uh, mini mall, right? And a lot of our uh, merchants still like link. They're living in the their shops are in the carcasses of like buildings, uh, just snatched up with the, by 
opportunity zone guys, right? They're like hanging on, but they're paying way too much rent. Everybody wants a um, mini mall and they want it back. And like there are uh, programs, I guess, uh, funding things to like start up mini mall types of things, I guess, federal money or something, but we have to find solutions. It's like, uh, yeah. I mean, it, I, it, like when you look at these old shops, what was it, Bryden's? It was like, you go to a department store and there's like three kinds of jeans, three shirts and a pair of shoes, right? That's a department store. People don't shop at those places anymore. So they're gone. Um, but we do know what works in Lincoln Heights. And uh, since we know what works and what everybody wants, we need to kind of get consensus with the community and work on some solutions because Broadway is terrifyingly uh, empty. Uh, Didia? Thank you, President Sarah. And thank you to all of our speakers tonight and to my fellow board members. I appreciate so much that we've had so many guests. Thank you, Sarah, for scheduling them. It's so great to have all these people. Thank you, Steve, for your time. Um, Battalion Chief Willis, thank you for your lifetime of service um, and all our other guests. We are now at two hours without a break. Um, for those of us who are differently abled, I suggest that that's inequitable and unhealthy, and I'd like to request a break for a few minutes. I've not been so rude as to leave the meeting um, without a break, um, and, I, and I'd like to request that we do have the two-minute time limit for commentary in the future, because um, I really appreciate all of our discussion, but we can create a, an atmosphere for discussion that's perhaps separate from the meeting where after two hours, we still have several important items that we need to vote on during limited time that we have a quorum. We cannot afford to lose even one person. And yet we're already two hours into the meeting. So thank you for letting us take a break very, very soon. I do need one now. All right. Thank you, Didia. Um, all right, so Vince, you have your little hand up there. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, so, Steve, if anybody wants to email you, what's your email? Could you uh, tell the community? Office at castonproperties.com. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sure. Steve. Okay. Thank you for having me on the agenda. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Good night. Um, <clears throat> all right. So now we're going to take a little break. Uh, Vince, should we take a five-minute break? Yeah? Oh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Eight, um, seven, eight, ten. Let me see if I can get our timer up. Anybody wants to sing a song? So the, the items that we have, I'm not going to talk about the items, but uh, I'm just revealing right here. So they're all letters and sis that have been uh, voted on in, through committee. So these just need board action. So the discussion has already happened with you. So all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you everybody for taking your, your break. Here we go. We're gonna, like I said, okay, so here we go. Eight, Planning and Land Use Committee. So we just had our meeting on the 27th. So these items under Planning and Land Use Committee, all of them uh, pluck recommended to approve on that day. So here we go. Eight, uh, Planning and Land Use Committee, a discussion of possible action on letter to HCID, LADBS and HCID, I think, um, seeking support for the Benitez family, victims of the 7 uh, 1922 apartment fire at 2219 North Griffin Avenue. So, um, do we have, uh, I have a supporting document um, with uh, transcripts of uh, what was on the news and a letter, and uh, it's to the city seeking support and then uh, inquiring and then advocating for some sort of protocol for uh, rent stabilized tenants uh, when, when fires break out in these apartments, some sort of support, some sort of fund. Um, and then, um, do we have a motion? I guess I'm... Vince, point of order, we lost Gil. We oh, lost Gil. He just left, huh? Well, it says we have 14, huh? Um, there's two repeated. Well, geez, let's see, attendees, huh? Well, Gil, uh, 
Well, okay, let me look at these items really quick. Darn. Um, ma, 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 ma. Well, none of these are going to council this week. Don't do demolitions. And then we have Mike and then, okay, so uh, we've lost Quorum. He's not calling back. Who else was absent, Nancy? And Richard. Okay, so you guys know we have a lot of vacancies. I have a supporting document on that. Vince, we lost Quorum, but I can, can I announce just the vacancies? They don't. They don't let us continue on with the agenda. Once oh, I have to stop. Okay, so um, we've lost quorum. So this meeting is now uh, over, right, Vince? Um, right. I'm sorry. Can we table this? No, we're going to continue these to the next meeting, Vince. If I wanted to, if we chose to do a special meeting because of urgency, mm -hmm. um, could that meeting be done? Uh, we don't need an X pump for that, correct? <clears throat> to no. a continuance if it's within a certain time period? Well, it's a 24 hours for a special meeting. And or I mean, if we were to continue this agenda, yeah, for a meeting within, uh, you know, this week or whatever. What I would do is just make sure to see which board members are going to be open and available. We can keep the 14, and that way call the meeting and find out what date. Yeah, 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 of course. Because it's, it's not our regular meeting, so people are going to have things planned. No, of course. Yeah, we do have a lot of meetings. Um, I just really want to get this letter out about the Benitez family and then about these demolitions because they're very time sensitive. But I guess, um, I mean, they were already approved by committee. Can the committee recommendation be, um, for instance, like the last pluck chair used to send, used to send the um, pluck uh, determinations? To applicants, and often those applicants, well, they thought those were the board determinations. But anyway, whatever. We do need board action on these letters. Entire board action yeah. corrections. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So we just let people know that the meeting officially ended. What time, Fernanda, did you have? Um, 8.14. 8.14 mm -hmm. PM. Uh, then the meeting will be rescheduled again. And everyone, if you can't pay attention to your emails, it's important because since it's not on our regular schedule, we have to put another day out of our week, right? So just be mindful of that to let uh, Fernanda or Sarah know so when they set it up, it'll be 24 hours after the announcement because it's a special meeting. Yeah, Vincent, can I just say something off the record or whatever? The work is a 